Some Singaporeans are already snapping up properties near the RTS link with Johor. Analysts are seeing home prices there grow by up to 20% in the last couple of years. But those in the industry say that while sales are picking up, some are still cautious. Rebecca Mateo with more. 66-year-old Daniel Ong recently bought two units from a project in Johor Bahru that's located near the causeway. He was drawn by the accessibility of the area, which will be enhanced after the rapid transit system is completed in the next couple of years. He has plans to rent out one of the units and use the other as a retirement or vacation home. My wife and myself, we sort of quite... Uh, uh, enjoy the food and uh, you know doing some shopping over there so we find that uh, the cost of living is definitely much uh, lower than Singapore. A two better condo in a property of walking distance to the RTS costs about $240,000. But demand has pushed up property prices in these areas by about 20% in the last two years. We see some of the projects more appealing ones, um, especially closer to the station. Um, the prices have went up by close to like 8 to 10%. Um, just over the past year. Now, when it's fully operational, I think we'll see another uh, increase of maybe to about 5 to 6%. Some analysts say properties that were completed years back have seen renewed interest from buyers in the last couple of years. This event as several new condominiums or service apartment projects have sprung up near the Bukit Chaga station. Analysts also say this area is set to be the ground for integrated development that will come with offices and retail spaces in the future. But even with all the potential the area has to offer, some are holding back. Property agents say that while they are getting about 50 inquiries a month, not all of them end up buying a unit. Some Singaporeans are hesitant when it comes to buying a property in a foreign land. I think for them, a lot of it is uh, unfamiliarity with JB. Uh. Some buyers, they, they like the idea, but they haven't been to JB in a long time or are not regulars to JB or are not familiar with the Malaysian uh, property buying process. For James Lim, it was the potential of earning a rental income that led to the decision to buy a two-bedder condo at a freehold mega project last month. When the RTS is open in two years' time, uh, this property price definitely, first, it will go up. Second, the rental price definitely will be quite attractive also as compared to the rest of the places. In fact, some analysts say rental prices for some areas have almost doubled from the pandemic period when the movement control order prevented travel and caused rental rates to fall. Any studio units uh, previously was probably asking about a thousand, um, I would say about a thousand to a thousand two per, uh, per month uh, during the MCO and is now uh, ranging anything from 2000 to 2003 per month. Over at Singapore, analysts expect to see some demand for homes near Woodlands North and they are expecting new residential units to be added to the hood in the future. Rebecca Mateo, CNA, Johor. What will be the economic impact of the rail transit system on both Singapore and Malaysia? To answer that, we have with us Dr. Timothy Wong, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Economics at the National University of Singapore. Thanks so much for coming this Thanks evening, for Dr. Me. Wong. All right, uh, we just heard my colleague there, Rebecca Mitter, talking about the huge potential and also the hesitation. Now, if we want to call this a game changer for both Singapore and Malaysia, how could it be? If that potential does come true, how would it actually be a game changer? Right, so the, the, the big difference here is when it comes to the causeway, the constraint is during peak hours, right? So in the morning when people want to get to work, in the evening when people are returning home um, to JB, these are people who um, work in Singapore but live in JB, um, there is a constraint there. We don't have enough capacity to get them through quickly, and so it takes people, we've heard these stories, right? Hours mm -hmm. to get to Singapore and from Singapore back to JB. So that's where this is sort of a game changer. You have an additional 10,000 uh, passengers who can, can travel between the two countries every hour. Um, 
So in the morning peak, you're looking at maybe 40,000 uh, open slots, right? And so that either means 40,000 more people can travel between Malaysia and Singapore, or it means that um, the people who are currently on this congested causeway, 40,000 of them can move to um, uh, the rail link, and that will mean everybody gets through more speedily. So I think that here we'll, we're, we're looking at um, time savings for these people who are getting to work, which means they're less fatigued and they can be more productive. It also means people can move from currently living in Singapore to be in JB. And so that's going to um, uh, uh, mean cost savings in terms of your rent. Um, so yeah, in, in all of these ways, I guess that's what uh, people are referring to when it, mm. they mean a game changer. Yeah. Now, Dr. Wong, that greater movement of people is going to have an impact as well on uh, the economics of the whole situation because you know, you, there's going to be an impact once you have supply and demand tussling with each other. It's going to affect prices one way or another. So is it all good news for Johor? Can, will, will, do you anticipate seeing the sort of change as far as the competitiveness between what you can get in Johor vis-a-vis -vis Singapore is concerned? Right, yeah. Um, it's not all good news. I mean, it's good news for um, property developers who are now selling homes at, um, will, at higher prices, um, as, we, as we've seen. Um, and will continue to do so if there is a continued demand for people who are currently living here um, to move to uh, live in JB and then and work in Singapore, right? So, but um, the losers here are the people who've been displaced. So people who currently live in JB, but maybe work in JB, or maybe they're retired. Um, and these people, um, maybe they rent, uh, and now they can't afford that rent, right? And so you'll see that um, there is going to be greater segmenting of income within JB because uh, the city centre, which is closest to Woodlands, is going to become a wealthier district. Um, and that will send um, people who have lower incomes um, to the periphery of the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, picking up what you said, essentially, if we ease that bottleneck at the causeway, it will change people's minds on where they might live relative to where they work. Are we going to be seeing uh, people, say, for example, living further inland uh, in Johor and other West Malaysian states, people from there perhaps thinking of coming to Singapore to work? Yeah, that's a possibility. I think, I mean, Malaysia is a very big country, 30 million people. And so this 40,000 um, additional slots that we have at the causeway is not a large number. So, mm. um, I mean, the grand scheme of things for Malaysians, they will not notice the difference. But um, maybe Singaporeans will notice that there are... Uh, 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 there is a larger ready supply of labor um, because we're a smaller country. Um, and so, yeah, in that sense, uh, we might notice that there are suddenly a lot more people willing to um, apply for jobs and work in Singapore. And they may come from not just Johor, but other parts of Malaysia as well. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Dr. Wong, let, let's talk a little bit about the uh, special economic zone uh, as well, the setup of that uh, and enlarging our economic sort of sphere, as it were, as far as Singapore is concerned. Uh, how do you anticipate that impacting the economics between Johor and Singapore and the opportunities that will be for businesses perhaps wanting to move out of Singapore into JB? Yeah, so the RTS is just part of this greater plan, right, which is to try and integrate these two, um, the economies of these two cities more closely. Um, and the RTS plays quite nicely into this special economic zone because it does uh, ease the movement of people across the border. Um, the big question is, from a um, business perspective, um, are there synergies that um, Singaporeans and Malaysians um, can make um, that can take place in JB? And I think the idea here is that Malaysia is rich in um, labour because it's a large population and rich in land. Mm -hmm. um, and so those types of resources, are there ways that Singaporeans yeah. can make use of it um, in a way that would enrich in both cities. Um, and maybe, maybe there are um, manufacturing opportunities, for example, where things that are made here, um, but it's expensive to do so because the land costs are high or labor costs are high, um, can be made in Malaysia and then exported. Um, I think those are the types of opportunities that um, they really want to um, harness. And the hope is that if we could reduce um, the red tape from administration or familiarize Singaporeans with the way of doing business in Malaysia, um, that, that, that that could really take off, yeah. Yeah. All right, so essentially, if we look at, as you see, the bigger picture, especially RTS being part of that bigger picture, there will always be someone who wins more than someone who might actually lose from this. Which sectors and roles might benefit the most from a special economic zone? Yeah, I mean, I think um, largely export-driven um, um, sectors will, will gain from this because I think the idea here is manufacturing, right? If we yeah. can think of ways that we can... Um, manufacture um, within Malaysia and then export it um, out. 
um, I think the Malaysians would be um, very happy with that. Um, in terms of um, who the losers could be, um, we, I guess, do worry about... Um, losers in terms of those who fail to harness the opportunities very quickly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there are... Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just blanking on that, right? <laughs> so maybe I can't answer no, that right okay, away. Right. Well, anyway, thanks so much for coming on in this evening, making time for that. Dr. Timothy Wong from the Department of Economics at NUS. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Yeah.